Hello again, my name is Paul Gilbert, I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation, and it's a delight for me to, inter to interview today my good friend from Australia, Dr. James um, Kirby. Um, now, James is one of the most prolific researchers in compassion and has just brought a new book out. So we're going to be talking about his research interests and focusing on how we can use his fantastic knowledge to create a more compassionate world. So let me tell you a little bit about him before we begin. So um, <clears throat> James is a senior lecturer and a clinical psychologist and the co-director of the Compassionate Mind Research Group at the University of Queensland. Uh, he has a broad research interest in compassion, but specifically examines factors that facilitate and inhibit compassionate responding. He also examines the clinical effectiveness of compassion-focused interventions, specifically in how they help with self-criticism and shame that underpin many depressions and anxiety disorders. James is an honorary associate professor at the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University. He is also on the board of the Global Compassion Coalition. In 2022, he authored the book, Choose Compassion, and we're going to look at that shortly. And in 2020, he co-edited uh, Making an Impact uh, on Mental Health. He serves as an associate editor for two international journals, Mindfulness and Psychology and Psychotherapy Theory, Research and Practice, which is a British Psychological Society Journal. And so it's uh, without more ado, we will chat to James and explore his wealth of knowledge about compassion and how we can apply it to creating a compassionate world. So James, welcome. And I know it's a bit late in the evening for you, but uh, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. And uh, my first question really is about how you got interested in compassion. What led you into wanting to explore compassion? Oh, thanks, Paul, and thanks for having me. The series has been a delight to, to listen to all the interviews you've done with such incredible researchers, so I'm really quite honoured to, to be part of that, so thank you. Um, yeah, I, my background was kind of in parenting, so I looked at uh, a parenting program to help parents and grandparents uh, in the very important role of helping raise the grandkids, and we were using sort of traditional uh, cognitive behaviour therapy approaches to help uh, the grandparents in that relationship, particularly around sort of, what's the right word, the inadvertent tensions that can come up between the parent and grandparent around a whole host of things of what to do, when and for how long and to who and so on. So these things can just pop up and memories from the past can emerge too very quickly around, well, you didn't do that to me and all of this kinds of stuff. Now, for a lot of people, the relationship works great, but for the work we were doing, that was a real kind of source of difficulty for the grandparents and parents. And so we kind of looked at uh, some fairly standard communication and problem-solving CBT strategies to help with that. Uh, and at the end of the randomized control trial, we didn't find any significant effects on improvement in that relationship, which was a, you know, a bit of a disappointment to say the least. Although we saw lots of other good improvements for parenting and, and child outcomes. But then we trialed it again in Hong Kong. We had it translated into Mandarin and we tried again and it didn't work. So that was a real shame. And then I thought, oh, well, we must try something different. This really isn't uh, working. And during that period, I stumbled across your work, Paul, you know, your work on compassion and its impact uh, with, you know, interpersonal relationships is just massive. And uh, I wish I had known about it before we developed the intervention. And so with my PhD student, uh, the now Dr. April Hong, we developed a, a sort of, a, based on your work, put together a compassion module uh, and put that into the intervention to help uh, parents in Vietnam, would you believe? So we had the material translate into Vietnamese and April delivered it there in Vietnam. And uh, we replaced the CBT communication problem solving with a compassion module around developing your compassion itself, strength, wisdom, commitment, and how you might bring that into the relationship. And woohoo, lo and behold, we had success. We got shifts on reductions in tension, greater warmth and greater emotional depth between the two. So absolutely delighted with that. But that was kind of my introduction into compassion and haven't stopped uh, following the trail of work you've left behind over 40 years, Paul. 
But that's, I mean, that, that work is astounding, isn't it, really? I mean, what you've done in terms of bringing um, compassion into working within families and parents and children. And and uh, you've just uh, done, you, you've done quite a lot of work with children, haven't you? Looking at some of the, what you call the boundaries or the limits to their compassion. Because sometimes, it, you know, there's this idea that children are just compassionate to everybody. But your work has kind of challenged that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there is a somewhat, I don't want to say naive, but seemingly naive view that we're just born to be compassionate. And that's the that's the natural kind of uh, tendency we have with everyone around us and and with who we um, you know interact with. And although there's a certain element of that, yes, we do have the, capen- uh, the uh, capacity or propensity to be compassionate with others. We also have a lot of other things that we like to do and 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 kind of act as well because there are other competing motivations in the background and so with kiddos you know there are certainly times when they're incredibly uh, helpful so you know there's a range of wonderful uh, studies documenting how you know if, if an experimenter drops something the child will help and this is work by uh, Felix Wernikin and Michael Tomasello uh, there's a lot of research showing in the early years uh, by Paul Bloom and so on um, that you know children like looking at pro-social agents as opposed to threatening agents and that kind of really laid the ground that children uh, are kind of ultimately kind and pro-social and then we kind of chip out that <laughs> over time kind of thing. But I wasn't so sure about that. Uh, I was kind of like, I'm sure if the environment's right, yep, we'll see it. But there'll likely be other factors at play that could easily turn uh, compassion off. So in 2017, with an honours student, Mitchell Green, and uh, another chap, uh, Mark Nielsen, a professor of developmental psychology, we developed a paradigm where the child would complete a series of tasks in which they would win a a reward if they completed it successfully. And they'd complete those tasks at the same time uh, with a puppet. And that puppet would be uh, opposite them and they'll be completing the exact same tasks. Now, it's really important to point out four or five-year-olds interact with a puppet much like they're a, a human being. And it's better to work with a puppet at that age than an adult because an adult brings in a power or an authoritative uh, element which could confound the finding. So the child might just do what they need to do because it's an adult and I have to do what the adult says. So a puppet's more uh, level uh, playing field. And so they play with these puppets as if they're a real agent and the puppet has to complete their task, the child's completing their task, but we rig the game so that the puppet can never complete their task. And then we look at what the child does. So we kind of just tell them they have to complete the task and then they can win their reward. And in this is where we manipulate. We either give children the chance to be helpful by giving them some extra pieces or we just have enough pieces for them to complete it themselves and get the sticker. Now, when there's extra resources, children help all of the time. They'll even help before the puppet has noticed that they're short on pieces. So they're very, very helpful in that condition. Fantastic, supports all the prior work. But when it gets to the point where the puppet realizes they don't have enough pieces, that's when we get the puppet to to give out a a series of uh, sort of prompts around being upset. So the first one is, oh no, I don't have enough pieces. I can't finish the game. And then we see what the child does there. And then the next prompt is, oh, no, I'm really upset. I'm not going to be able to finish and get my sticker. And then the third prompt is, I'm so upset, I'm going to cry. So we see what the child does during these series of distress prompts, the poor kiddos. And what we find there is when they're giving those distress prompts, if the child only has enough to win the sticker themselves, they just won't share. They'll keep uh, those resources. They won't share. Uh, but interestingly, after that task is complete in the experiment, it says, okay, that one's done. Well, you got all your pieces. Here's your sticker. Well done. Now the puppet didn't get their pieces. So no sticker for them. The child will say things like, uh, oh, no worries. Maybe next time you can win or, you know, it's okay. It'll be all right. But then we give them three of those tasks. And on all of those occasions, the child just never shares. So then we start to see, okay, there are sort of boundary conditions. If you have to give up something, which is a reward for you, sort of a cost, uh, this will act as an inhibitor uh, to compassionate behaviour. And so we've tested that now uh, with over 300 children aged four to five 
changing aspects of that paradigm to see uh, what factors may drive compassionate behavior and what factors even turn it off even even more quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's absolutely stunning research and very, very important for the theme of our interview, you know, creating a compassionate world, because, as you know, we think the competitive behavior does actually turn off mechanisms in the brain. It actually turns off things like empathy and stuff like that. And we have this idea that, you know, there is this basic motivation for control and hold versus care and share and one of the big issues in the world really is that people do not want to share their resources and so <laughs> understanding it in children and that when it comes to giving up things that you want yourself which is really a mark of altruism that's what altruism is really making the sacrifice for the other that's when we run yeah. into difficulties and do you and your work shows that that shows up very early in children which i think is phenomenal but it has implications for compassion training in schools do you think what, what do you think the implications of your studies are in terms of working with children to develop their compassion yeah, I think you, you, there's quite a few important implications, but you nailed it with that kind of dynamic of the competitiveness versus compassionate kind of uh, uh, desires being in conflict when you, the kids are in those tasks, the task situations we put them in. And at the moment, uh, the cost is just too overpowering for them. Uh, so the co competition wins out. One condition we had is rather than give them their own individual pieces and tasks, we would put all of the pieces in the middle. So it was like a shared pool for the puppet and the child. And we would say to the puppet and the child, okay, so you've got your puzzle in front of you. All of the pieces to complete it are in the middle for you to share. Um, the idea is, is to complete the task. And if you complete it, you'll get the stickers. And we had thought that perhaps that would lead to more share and care behavior led to the exact opposite. They became more competitive because now the resource they had to fight for to get <laughs> to put the pieces in the puzzle. So, I mean, that that kind of went um, uh, contrary to what we were anticipating. The only time where we, we saw it turned off was when we gave that ins explicit instruction to the kids um, that they could share and that it was fine to share and regardless of... Uh, how they perform at the task, they'll both get they'll both get stickers. So in those instances, children will increase their helping, but still not to the point of constantly helping as if there was extra resources. Still, the highest we could shift it up in that uh, condition was fifty percent. Whereas when there's just extra pieces, the kids will help almost every single time. So it, there's something about when you kind of try to bring out the competitive, competitive aspect of that task, children are more willing uh, to, be, to be sharing. In one condition, as soon as the kids finish the task, we give them uh, the sticker and say, you've won, well done, it's finished, but the puppet's still going. And in that condition, when we give the reward immediately, the child then takes their pieces and gives it to the puppet. So that was a really kind of neat nuance where we were able to show actually when the child believes it's all done and I've got mine, I would I will then actively help the other person get theirs. Um, kind of signaling again the importance of once that's turned off, we, we can get into share and care uh, behavior. But uh, the implications are quite a, quite a number. I mean, one is how do we set up our environments? Like what are the rewards that we have in place that we pull as levers to get children to do what we want? Sometimes we inadvertently put in reward charts and, and systems to get children to do behavior. Now, if they're linked to share and care, um, it might not work the way in which we want. So we set up a, an environment where we wanted share and care, put rewards in as well. As soon as those two things are kind of competing for each other, children can kind of get caught up in the competitive aspect and perhaps the reward is doing a disservice. Uh, another one, uh, aspect is is sometimes children are blamed or, or kind of um, kind of you know belittled by parents or adults or teachers for not sharing. So children know at four and five that the so social norm rule is to share, but they really struggle with the self control to share. They'll say, "Yeah, I should share," but they really struggle with that. At age uh, six seven, they start to go through um, a, a developmental milestone in growth. And they say not only 
is it important to share that, that but then they actually do engage in much more uh, sharing behavior and so kids really struggle with that but they can kind of you know be roused on by their parents for not sharing but it's like kids at four or five their brains just haven't maturated to the point to enable them to do that yet we're punishing them and so it leaves kids going well like what have I done like they can't piece it together you know they don't understand why they're being punished and uh, sometimes I think letting parents know about that takes out some of the attack that they have on the kids where they perhaps feel their kid isn't doing the quote unquote right thing yeah, I mean, that's such an incredibly important point you make there, isn't it, about helping parents understand that children's don't just, they're not mini adults, you know, they don't have certain competencies, they don't, their brain isn't processing information. I mean, it, it also reminds me of some of the work that's been done on theory of mind and the development of theory of mind and empathy awareness, which doesn't come on, as you say, till after five, probably, that capacity. Yeah, yeah to understand the, in detail about uh, the issues of sharing and the importance of sharing. Oh, exactly. So, I mean, that's really important for compassion because, you know, when we're trying to be compassionate, we want to get a sense of what the other person is experiencing, what's going on for them. And so, you know, is it a case that we see, you know, very important caring behaviour from kids early on, but it's not until they get a greater sense of themselves and also have a better ability to understand other minds think differently to theirs that uh, then allows compassion to really start to flourish at that point, you know. And some of the conditions kids find themselves in, they just don't know what to do because they haven't yet built the skill set to know how to respond appropriately uh, to the suffering they encounter. It's really tricky. Yeah, it's a, but I think it's really important, isn't it? Because it means that when we come to do compassion training, the way that we do compassion training in children needs to be very sensitive to their developmental competencies. And there's no point in trying to, to get children four and five to, to, to share and care if they're not really at that level of empathic awareness, you know. So yeah. that's a very, very important, you know, point that you're making about this. Um, and the other point that I think is very important is the social context. That's why your work with families is so important, because the whole issue really is in creating a more compassionate world. We need to create more compassionate people, right? Yeah. <laughs> we live in a world that is so focused on competitiveness and getting ahead and shaming people and social media and all that. So we're, we're up against it a little bit. So um, what are your thoughts about that in terms of working with families and and uh, children, because you know, obviously families want their children to get ahead and get good careers and everything. Yes. How, how can we bring in more of a compassion focus with families and, and in schools, do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a million dollar question. <laughs> question. I haven't got the, the exact answer uh, to it, but except that it is complicated, but families do offer a context which they can really have a very a powerful influence on how kids uh, view compassion, experience compassion. I mean, the first experience children have of compassion is receiving it from their parents or, or perhaps an older sibling or an auntie or uncle or, or grandparent. So it really acts as a fertile kind of ground to help support uh, enablers to compassion. And uh, a lot of the work I was doing prior to working in compassion was, is often on the other side of the coin where parents were uh, quite attacking of kids, um, you know, name calling, um, even hitting, uh, these kinds of things. And those kinds of actions in early childhood can make children start to become more fearful uh, of compassion. And there's been great research by yourself and Marcella Matos and others who have kind of looked at how did the origins of fears of compassion uh, develop? And work we've done here uh, in our lab as well has shown that, you know, as adults, if you've got high fears of compassion, this is uh, extremely predictive of difficulties with shame, self-criticism, depression and anxiety and, and, and poor uh, well-being. So to intervene there at the, the parenting level when the kids are young, um, I think is a hugely powerful uh, intervention that we can bring in but families need support as well you know parents just can't be expected to be able to know what to do um you know right from the get-go the way the kind of societies have kind of shifted over time particularly in the west 
we don't have a lot of parenting support. You know, we move. A lot of people, their own parents are miles away, if not, you know, states or countries away. So with all this globalization and movement, the parenting uh, family village that you would have grown up in uh, back in the day, um, maybe back in your day, Paul, um, you had a lot more support and, and role models around you to help with that. Whereas one question we ask in our compassion, uh, tra uh, compassionate uh, uh, mind training to parents is, before you became a parent, how much time were you spending in your day with kids? So before you became a parent, how much time were you spending a day with kids? And sometimes we go, okay, if not day, week, fortnight, month. And some of them would say, well, I don't really spend any time with kids for years unless the, they had a brother or a sister who had been a parent and they were an uncle and aunt. And so it's been for some up to 10 years since they've had regular contact with kids because 18, start their career at university, whatever it might be, get into their profession, um, stay with that group and that um, professional network and so on. And they just haven't got, because those communities they're working don't have kids around them. You know, the kids are kind of taken out of all of our workplaces. So we don't see them and don't hear them. And if you don't see and hear them um, and see other people interact with them, you can kind of be you kind of be left a little bit in the dark. You kind of don't recognize, you know, what are standard typical developmental milestones. Um, you're kind of feeling like, you know, you, you should know, but I don't know. I think that's one of the reasons why we have like a billion dollar industry in parenting. Like you just there's so many self-help books and books around because I think they're kind of replaced what would have been the traditional support you would have been growing up with in daily life. I mean, that's a brilliant point, isn't it? I mean, you know, the work of Darcy Navas who's actually done one of these interviews that, in fact, um, you need a community to bring up a child. In hunter-gatherer societies, um, often the children didn't even spend the, most of the time with the parent. They would have a, you know, preferred uncle or an older brother or something like that. But, um, you know, they always had someone they could go to and interact with and so forth. And it was a shared so young mothers were seeing older mothers and so on and so on. So yes. it's a brilliant point that you make. And now we live in these very segregated lifestyles where people are closeted away in their own homes and, and so on and so on. It, and a lot of women don't get the support, anywhere near the support, or families actually don't get the support that, that, that we need to bring up caring, sharing kids. So I, I think that's a really important point. Do you see any way in which that could be addressed, that ability to create more of a community for uh, uh, looking after and bringing up our children? Yeah, uh, there are a couple of ideas. One idea is, and this was perhaps uh, just standard policy in uh, the, the more Nordic countries, is actually give a lot of parental leave, allow parents, both mum and dad, to have extended paid parental leave so they can spend that time with their kids, taking them um, uh beyond just the traditional home, the family of origin kind of at home in your house, out into the world where they get to see other people with them. And uh, and it kind of creates this kind of safeness uh, feel for them because they know they're supported by their government or by their employer because they've got a year or two year paid leave. And so that builds a really trusting relationship between uh, the two of them, but also it enables the, the parent to, you know, um, connect with the child beyond just, you know, the 6 to 7 p.m., you know, kind of little nightmare hour where you're kind of cooking, cleaning, getting them prepared for bed. You've just returned home from work. You know, uh, people are stressed out and you've got to do everything very quickly in a short period of time. Uh, so I think that kind of parental uh, care would be, you know, to be able to spend uh, prolonged periods. I know some uh, companies here in Australia, for example, uh, provide uh, a two-year paid uh, paternity uh, leave option that you can activate at any point before the kid's 12. And so you can activate them at different different stages of life because we know the first three years are, are really important, but you know that doesn't mean the other years aren't important either. So to build that flexibility into the system to help parents make those decisions, I think is really cool. So that would be one thing. The other thing is also making sure that parents can get easy access to support. Uh, so a big thing in Australia has been trying to make parenting a public health issue. You know, you shouldn't have to scratch your head um, 
or not be able to freely access support, particularly if you are having a lot of difficulties and you shouldn't have to be out of pocket for getting access to that help. Uh, so one is just making, uh, you know, evidence-based uh, parenting support free and available. And I think the, 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 the return on investment on something like that uh, is, is astronomical. Yeah, that's, that's, that's such an important point. And we then you probably see we also had Julian Abel um, talking about building compassionate communities and actually facilitating young uh, parents to form communities of young parents. I know when we had our children, you know, there was the um, prenatal uh, meetings with other mums to be, but once mm. the was there, that was it. There was nothing else. And so there was no community to kind of click into. So, you know, we were there by ourselves, our families weren't there, but there wasn't any community to click into because there was no continuity post-birth. And I, I suspect that if we would create communities of people who can go through a journey together, so not only for prenatal, but actually for the first few years of life, they can meet up and talk and they can be, you know, invited to come back together and, and so on and so on. It, it, that's oh, absolutely. Really I mean, mothers report that their loneliness increases significantly post-birth, uh, massive levels of loneliness for them. Um, and at the same time, of the father groups that exist, most commonly, they're still held in a pub. I mean, it's like we're still holding on to this sort of stereotype of, you know, men in pubs with beer. That's how they talk about fatherhood. And really nothing around fatherhood is really discussed all that much. Um, and the women come together and they'll do something like, you know, go into a park with the kids um, and do something. And, the, and even in those instances where dads are invited, they'll sort of stand off by themselves having a beer and, and chatting amongst the dads about sport or something like that. There are still massive um, problematic uh, stereotypes and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, experiences that have been held for 50 years around how, if not longer, around the differentiating gender roles between mum and dads have in, in, in children's lives that are still very, very significant today. Yeah, I think much longer than 50 years, I think it goes way, doesn't it, way, way back. Um, so, well, you're right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, a lot of the work <laughs> you're doing, you see, I think is really highlighting all of these key issues about the if we want a compassionate world, we need to have compassionate people and that means we need to help them develop compassionate brains and we need to create the social context for that to happen that means we need to understand the kinds of things you've been researching what are the facilitators and inhibitors in in young children and later on and that brings us on to the fact that you have done a lot of work on facilitators and inhibitors you did a big meta-analysis didn't you back in 2019 which was quite extraordinary but you've also done a lot of your own work on, on this and the moral compass that's the other area of your uh, which is so fascinating yeah i mean one of the the i mean that meta-analysis was kind of a study i was kind of alluding to earlier i mean that scale you develop for the fears of uh, compassion um i mean you developed that i think in 20 uh 10 or 11 um and we meta-analyzed it across 2018 2019 and we had data from over five and a half thousand people who had um completed that scale and it would have gone you know, uh, through the roof now, uh, probably double that now. Um, so we need to do an update. But um, yeah, it's very clear there's a, a very significant uh, relationship between uh, fears of compassion and mental health. That's that's a real, uh, real problem area. And so it's kind of like, how do you help people start to develop a more compassionate mind when they fear it? And it causes all of these difficulties. Uh, and that's, of course, where it leads into all of your um, brilliant uh, compassion focused therapy work. But Another angle to that is you can fear compassion for reasons that aren't concerning perhaps how you were treated in childhood necessarily, but you could you can kind of have um, a block to compassion because you feel that actually being caring towards another group or extending it to another uh, target beyond your typical boundary um, comes at a cost. It's almost, they call it a uh, zero sum belief. And so there's this belief that um, if I'm to extend care to you, that means loss of care for me. And so for some, there's this belief that I can only extend my concern uh, to a, a select few. 
uh, because really I need to ensure that my group or my family or whatever it is, is being cared for. And this of course ties into your work with uh, social mentality theory and um, competitive motivations versus uh, compassionate uh, orientations. And, you know, we've been, you know, living in a capitalistic society, very um, individualistic with this, this sort of hyper competitive mindset um, that kind of has been drilled over us hundreds of years. Um, it kind of makes it very difficult for compassion to emerge in that environment. Um, it's amazing that it has <laughs> in many ways that, you know, there are these pockets of communities who um, do show incredible compassion. And sometimes it takes a moment of tragedy to sort of see the compassionate kind of response show itself. But uh, the moral expansiveness work we've looked at is kind of starting to consider how far does your uh, sense of moral concern extend? Does it extend beyond just the human kind of in-group families? Does it extend out to animals? Does it extend out to the environment? And does it extend, extend out to people who have caused great harm? So you think of murderers and so on. So at what point does your concern kind of uh, have its boundary limit? And what we have found is uh, in the research we've done is a lot of people have in, uh, done work in this space showing that empathy uh, is very important for moral expansiveness. Uh, mindfulness can also uh, potentially be important for moral expansiveness. So we did some work looking at those uh, constructs alongside compassion and fears and compassion. And we found that when you look at compassion and fears, empathy and mindfulness become no longer significant in explaining any um, noise in moral expansiveness. And the biggest uh, factor for moral expansiveness was fears of compassion. So the work we're doing now, Dr. Uh, Charlie Crimson and I are really starting to look at, uh, you know, what are those particular mechanisms at play that influence a restricted moral expansive mindset and how compassion training can start to shift people into growing their moral expansiveness because there's this belief that it's got a net capacity and it can't grow. But um, in some research we've just done, we've found you can grow it. But um, that's under review at the moment. Okay, so we look, we we'll certainly look forward to that very much. And um, you've also done uh, some really fascinating work uh, looking at important distinctions between things like kindness and compassion as well. And uh, you had this paper published in Mindfulness last year, I think it was. Um, so that was really interesting, wasn't it? That we find that you know kindness is quite different to compassion, really. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, this is work uh, that you know you, Jazz, myself, and and a couple of others have really helped contribute to. But some of that early work was was looking at people's willingness to be uh, kind and compassionate, and the different emotional experiences people uh, would experience whilst um, imagining being kind or, or compassionate. And we saw big differences there. And then we extended it to look at getting people to imagine someone that they know and like, and also someone that they know and dislike, and then imagine being kind or compassionate to them. Now, the good news is when you like them, you're always kind and compassionate. That's fantastic. But when it's someone you know and dislike, you, you drop to floor levels in your willingness to do some, do a kind act for them. You just not at all. Um, so it's very jarring, as you can imagine. <laughs> I hate this guy. <laughs> Why would I do anything kind for him? And of course, kindness is like, you know, favours or gestures you might do to show the person that they're important or they matter to you. So they don't have to be suffering. But then when we look at people who they know and dislike and we put a compassionate scenario um, in front of them, uh, people's willingness to be compassionate to them, it drops, but nowhere near to the same degree as if it was kind. So... Um, yeah, I think if we're going to start to address uh, address those people in our lives or the world and there's dislikeness um, there, and dislikeness is a very big, and likeness is a very big uh, factor that facilitates and inhibits, um, compassion is, our, is a much more promising gateway in to, you know, connecting with that disliked other and possibly through that shifting the texture and, and um, and the connection you have with that person. Because, you know, all of a sudden you, you, you're engaging and doing something and depending on how that interaction is received and goes, it could very much be transformative uh, for that relationship. 
So we have to look at ways that we can overcome these traditional boundaries we have. And I think uh, compassion is probably, well, as far as I'm concerned, it's the, the key to unlocking uh, a morally expansive mindset and creating a compassionate worlds. Yeah, that's, that's, and then your work is so informative on that. And um, we won't go anywhere near the word love because that will put me through the <laughs> But this definition, I think, which comes from Buddhism and other places, you know, about the, this preparedness, the sensitivity to engage in pain, and your first movement is always going to be stressful. You're not going to a party. Compassion requires you to go into something stressful and the ability to tolerate that and be prepared to understand that. And then the second aspect of the algorithm is, so what are you going to do? And there's quite a lot of evidence now that if you just stick with the first one, just being empathic, oh dear, isn't this terrible? That, that burns you out. But that second part of the being motivated to do something, I think is, is really quite important. And the problem with the fears of compassion is that the, you can have a fear in both. You can be frightened. I don't really want to have to experience that. I, you know, I feel overwhelmed by it. And um, I haven't got a clue what to do anyway. So, and I don't think they deserve it. <laughs> so, um, so that's such an important area, isn't it? That we get people to really understand that the root of compassion is this, this courage and wisdom to engage and work out what to do. You know, it's not about being kind necessarily or nice or loving somebody. You can be compassionate to people we don't like which is what your work has clearly demonstrated. So these are very, very important concepts. Um, I was asked the other day, somebody asked me, um, but do you think compassion is enough, really? It's not really enough, is it? <laughs> very clear. They haven't really understood what it is. And you say, so, well, it's a deep sensitivity to suffering, a sense to whether they're real prepared to do something about it, whether you're a firefighter or a COVID worker or a counselor. You know, what more do you want? <laughs> 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 that's that's so, right this work that you're doing is so important where where do you sit i want to talk about your book in a minute but before that so oh. all this brilliant work that you've done in quite a number of different areas as we've touched on where are you going you know where are you where is your research going where do you want to take it in the next few years yeah one of the uh, we've just been funded uh, by a, a a lovely grant uh the peace grant from the mind and life institute uh, which is going to fund our work for the next two years. So very grateful for that. Uh, but the work there we're trying to address speaks to the intention behaviour gap that we have with compassion. And so kind of speaks directly to what you're talking about there with the algorithm. So we we have great intentions and we, we kind of will circle on surveys, oh, yes, no, I intend to be very compassionate. <laughs> but then when it comes to the opportunity to then be compassionate, it doesn't always um, it doesn't always go perfectly. You know, often there is kind of a, a fairly significant gap between what we say we'll do and what we actually do. And of course, there's a whole host of factors um, that can influence uh, someone not acting compassionately in a, in a situation. But we're trying to work out what are some of the the core factors uh, that help drive the the behaviour, uh, but also what are the core factors uh, stopping you from acting? Uh, so we're trying to look at ways, uh, uh, well, well, factors that influence the magnitude of that gap, because if we can start to find out what those are, we might be able to shift um, the focus of interventions if we need to, to try to help reduce that the extent of that gap. So just by way of an example, you know, there aren't a lot of studies that have looked at actual compassionate behavior a lot of it is sort of captured through self-report um, but of some of the work that has been done uh, there was a person who is on crutches who is in a lot of pain and has nowhere to sit and what they test is whether or not the participant will give up their seat for this person who's in pain so they're clearly suffering of physical pain and these participants would have either gone through an eight-week compassion training course or not and what they find is if you've gone through eight weeks of training, you're significantly more likely to give up your chair, but only 50% of those did. So, I mean, it's extraordinary. Like you do eight weeks of training, like, you know, 16 hours um, of, you know, uh, time in the group, let alone all of the practice work you do between. And that just leads to 50% of that group helping someone who is in pain, uh, you know, with an injured, injured leg. 
I mean, it's low level helping too. It's just giving up your seat. So it kind of feels like in terms of cost, that's an extraordinarily low cost to give up um, in order to, to kind of show up, you know, uh, 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 express compassion towards them. And they've done other work showing that if you just do self-directed audio over three weeks, um, it still leads to increased helping in that paradigm, but it drops to 33%. And so, you know, it's kind of, I find that kind of slightly, um, well, I think that's really important, that finding firstly, but also uh, slightly disheartening to know that, you know, despite all of this work and deliberate training, it's still not translating to just even low level um, compassionate behavior um, in low level suffering conditions. So what, what's going on there? One, one belief was it all had to do with empathic accuracy. If you could, if that was strong, surely you'd be able to pick up that this person was in pain and, and you'd be okay, but that didn't do anything. So um, we're trying to work out what's going on there. And I think part of it is often when we're practicing um, compassion, we're not rehearsing in our mind the action part of what it is that we could do. So if you're in therapy, even if you're in like sports or performance, you will be imagining the acts that you would be doing in order to do the to do the tasks successfully. You know, we do it in exposure, for goodness sake, you know, imaginal exposure and it, it works. But with compassion, we don't spend a lot of time in that second part of imagining what is it that you could be doing that would be um, compassionate behavior. So we're testing to see if we get people doing that, imagining, practicing the imagining of being compassionate, will that lead to um, a reduction in that divide between intention and behavior? I think, yeah, I think that's brilliant. And that comes because you have a very clear view that it's an algorithm. It's a stimulus response algorithm. And it doesn't necessarily mean because you have the stimulus you, the response will follow that they, they, they might but it doesn't necessarily there are many areas in life you know like going to the gym or saying i know I yes. <laughs> I don't. Exactly. um so that's such an important point that you're making and also you know you, you've seen this with clients no doubt they'll say things like what well, well i thought about it but it never occurred to me to do something you know i saw yeah. that i never thought oh i could give up my chair i didn't have that thought i had to thought oh they're suffering poor poor person but I didn't have the thought, and if I gave up my chair, that would help them. So, so the interesting question is, did they have the thought and dismiss it? No, I don't want to give up my chair, so that he can suffer in vain. Or did they simply not think about the action? So what you're yeah. doing, I think, is absolutely fundamental. I mean, do people think about an action or do they just yeah. not think about an action? Exactly. And like, and, and we've found, in fact, in one study we did, which was about promoting pro-social behavior in an unequal world, we put groups of people together and they had to complete tasks. And the task that they would have to complete is put Lego pieces together in such a way that it would constitute a food item. And we gave an instruction to the groups that uh, you had to work as fast as you could within five minutes to create as much food as you can uh, to prevent kids from starving. But it was a kind of an ambiguous instruction we never said you had to do that for your group it was just kind of you just need to create food and the two groups were working side by side and one group would have a lot of resource to make uh, the lego pieces too much and so they, they would have excess and the other group would have the same amount of lego but just lego pieces that wouldn't work in terms of putting the food together and uh, the amount they had meant that they could complete it in two, three minutes, and then you're just sitting there idle, not, nothing else to do. And of course, what we were hoping were people would see that and go, let's share the resources so we can create more food um, so less children will starve. And uh, what we did was we gave one group compassion training just prior, like a 10-minute meditation, um, and another group just an imagery exercise. We found that had zero impact on the behavior. <laughs> It's just like, damn. Um, another condition we did was we put a confederate, which is someone in on the study in the group, and every minute they would say a prompt. And so the prompt would be, oh, look at that group. They haven't got any pieces. They haven't got a lot of pieces, sorry. And then a minute later they would say, well, maybe we should share our pieces with them. And then the third one would be, don't you think we should share their pieces with them? And then finally, I'm going to share. And we found when you put a confederate in there putting a norm or, or showing some leadership, I suppose, um, they shared within the second or third prompt almost every time and you started to see increased food being made. So sometimes my point is the best way to get compassionate behaviour occurring is to think of leadership 
and, and what kind of leaders are we putting into power and what type of leaders are we voting for with their agendas in terms of it, it's very easy for to come in with an instruct like a, a prompt like that and you see total change of behavior and that's an easy thing to implement whereas with the 10 minute meditation making them all do it it had zero impact on on their sharing behavior so kind of gets this idea of did they even have the thought but as soon as someone tells them bang they're away they'll do it um the other one is i think particularly for kids but also critically for adults is just we are copiers we are a big time imitators what we see, we do. And if we can show more examples of compassionate behaviors and the, the various compassionate behaviors that occur so frequently, it almost becomes boring. But if we highlight that and what people do do, I think we increase the chances that others will copy and do it. I think that's brilliant, James, because, you know, there's a, if there is a movement that all we need to do is to teach these leaders to be mindful or something like that. Um, and that... <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be very helpful. But the point that you're making is that there needs to be a change in behavior. Uh, and that's such a key. I mean, you remind me a little bit of Philip Zimbardo's work on the heroic project, you know, where oh, yeah. this idea about creating individuals who behave compassionately and they become um, like in um, guides and, and heroes, as it were. He talks about heroes that people can follow they and so on and so on. And certainly within schools, that idea about having compassionate examples that other kids can kind of work around, get try and identify some of the more as it were, dominant kids in a classroom and teach them compassion and show them how to uh, share it with other kids and get them all onto the following. Uh, those kinds of ideas, I think, are incredibly important in terms of training and compassion around this sitting. I mean, mindfulness is great. I'm not, not knocking mindfulness, mm -hmm. but we have to do the kind of work you're doing and really focus on how do you change behaviors? Because as you know, in clinical psychology, that's a big issue. Behavior change, people will change their attitudes, but not necessarily their behavior. So that's, I think your work is just stunning. So well, it's all influenced by you, Paul. <laughs> well, that's why I say stunning, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. But no, of course that's true. We must finish with this amazing book you've done called Choose Compassion. Um, so can you tell us about that? So how did that come about? And, and what, you know, what do you want people to get out of reading that book? Yeah, I mean, that was a real surprise. I got contacted uh, by a publication company here in Australia just asking me if I'd ever thought of writing a book on compassion. And uh, to be honest, I hadn't. I, I, I kind of felt like uh, in many ways, a lot of the things that I would want to say had already been said. <laughs> so uh, that what, was it, what, what would be the point? I, I can kind of uh, just direct people to one of your books, Paul. That, that, just go there. That, that, that'll, that'll do the trick. Um, but they they persuaded me and convinced me, no, nah, it'd be good to get, you know, a young Aussie um, view on, on compassion and trying to convey what, what compassion is. And so, uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, at the exact time, like two weeks later, I agreed to do it, COVID hit. And so I was like, oh, God, I had to write this book through that whole period of, uh, you know, such tragedy and uncertainty and um, not being able to go out and do things, being locked in this kind of little office a lot of the time, just trying to work out oh, what what do I say here? What do I do? And, you know, there were lots of tremendous examples of compassion. So it was easy to be inspired in some ways. But at the same time, you just didn't want to write about COVID the whole time in the book, you know, because there's obviously compassion is more than that. But um, it's also such a great illustrative example of, you know, how our competitive motives when there's like a scarce resource for a vaccine can lead to hoarding behavior and us poaching drugs from low and middle income countries that desperately need it more than us. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can also see the nasty stuff pretty quickly. So um, it took longer than what I intended it to take the book, but I'm, I'm blaming COVID, but I uh, had a lot of support from colleagues and friends. And I guess the, the take home is in the book is, is, is perhaps uh, two things it always changes what i think the take-homes are but i think i think one of the take-homes is, is is firstly just how important family can be to helping lay the, the grounds and how we can help parents with that um, is really important uh, for compassion uh, but also secondly trying to think creatively about compassionate behavior compassion is so much more than a hug um, or a kiss or you know a, a there there it's um as you said it requires a incredible amount of courage and wisdom and so trying to really get people to think creatively about how they can use the skills they've got 
for some compassionate purposes is really important because if we were all trained as doctors, that would not be good because we, there are more than just health problems that our society faces. We need a whole diverse array of skill, but then how can you use that skill in some way to try to make a difference and alleviate suffering in some way? And so try to try to plant that thought in there for people in the book was, was one of my aims. Yeah, it's a wonderful aim. I mean, it's a beautifully written book where you weave in um, easy to understand concepts about why choose compassion. I mean, you answered the question very well in the book, um, but also some of the scientific evidence. And uh, this idea, I think, is such an important idea that, you know, within universities, there is a university here, I can't remember which one it is, but says to all of the um, undergraduates in engineering, how are you going to use what you learned for the benefit of humanity? How are you going to use your knowledge to benefit, you know? And I think that's a really great question to put towards to students. So it's not just about you benefiting you, but you, how are you going to use your engineering knowledge to, or, or geographic knowledge or whatever? Um, James, um, we've really gone <laughs> for longer than I was anticipating because you're just such a fascinating person to talk to. We could talk to you forever. Um, so is there anything that you would like to add in terms of your vision of how you see we could create a, a compassionate world before we go? Because you're doing so much work to advance it, I think. And... <laughs> oh, just to say, I think what you do in the foundation is just been so helpful at getting people uh, inspired. And really, you, you, you kind of set this really wonderful uh, example, which picks up like a contagion and the amount of researchers now doing compassion around the world because they've been introduced to it through the work you've done is is really so important and can't be um, understated so uh, thank you Paul and uh, I think what the foundation is doing and other groups that are emerging like uh, you know the Global uh, Compassion Coalition and someone with Rick Hansen are going to be and, and Jennifer Nadel with Compassion Politics I mean these are what we need people coming together with this energy and i think compassion has energy behind it to kind of get this behavior happening is really an exciting piece for me now yeah absolutely but it has to be based on the science and i do see you as one of the top you know international world scientists in compassion i mean the work that you're doing is fundamental and you know uh, life-changing james has been a delight and a privilege to talk to you and to you on our interview series. So thank you so much. And we're looking forward to seeing you at the conference in October. Uh, thanks, Paul.